Wonderful. Welcome. Thanks everyone for, for coming. Uh, this is a talk arranged as part of the open space sessions for the Together We Can Summit. It's a transition town summit looking at how, if we come together, what amazing things we could do to really transform the world. So especially our towns, wherever it is we live and wherever it is, you know, whatever communities it is that we are engaged with. So, yeah, so the idea of uh, this talk is just really to start talking about community forest gardens. So I guess maybe the, or the, the real joys and the real, why, why I'm so passionate about community forest gardens. So I guess the first place to start really is to look at, well, what is a forest garden? Is there anyone who'd like to give me what, their definition might be of a forest garden or what they think a forest garden is? Anyone who'd like to offer something? Yeah, Alex, go for it. Have a go, everyone seems quite shy. <laughs> um, for me, a forest garden is like you're mimicking the edge of a forest and you're working on a layer system. So, you, you know, you've got your ground cover and you and you breathe edge and you're going up to the trees and everything in between. Exactly. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah, so couldn't have said it better. It's just mimicking a the edge of a forest which sustains itself. It doesn't water, it doesn't need someone externally watering it. It doesn't need someone to bring in nutrients. It just manages and takes care of itself. And yet it can be quite productive. And so um but a because one of the 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 reasons what well, or what the kind of things you find in a uh, typical forest edge are quite small fruits um whereas we want you know we want bigger plums we want bigger apples etc cetera, etc cetera. so the reason why nature only produces small fruits is because as a tree your survival strategy is to produce as many seeds as possible so that an animal will eat the fruit carry it away with a dollop of nutrients plant it somewhere and grow so your strategy is to produce as many seeds as possible to maximize your chances of survival so knowing how much nutrients you have in the ecosystem around you will dictate how many seeds you can produce and and so if you think about it what is the interest why would a, a plant why would a tree produce a hundred big fruits compared to a thousand small fruits you know from a survival strategy there's absolutely no advantage in producing all this extra flesh you know and having a lot less seeds so if we think about it the you know the the, the big fruits are all kind of there because man has been you know human beings have been cultivating it and the reason why it's the other reason why it's not in nature is because uh, or, or the limiting factor in nature is nature doesn't produce enough nutrients for trees to get greedy and to produce really big fruits so what a forest garden is is just understanding that pattern and saying okay if we want bigger fruits let's just add extra nutrients so think understand where the cycles are for where nutrients come from and just stack our system to include those extra nutrients. So what kind of yield do you think we might get from a forest garden? Again, yeah. Is my sound not so loud? Hold on, let me check my, oh no, that's, the microphone's fairly high up. It's not, um, Okay, I can try unplug. I don't know if that's improved it for whoever was saying they couldn't hear me properly. Um, is, is everyone else hearing me? Okay. Yeah, okay. See several thumbs yeah. up. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, um, ah, tinny. I don't know about that. I can't, no idea what I can do. I can, yeah, th this is the only microphone I've got and I've been using it for years and no one else has really complained so far about 
tininess. So I don't know whether that's at your end. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. What what kind of yields can we get from a forest garden? What what kind of things could we get out of it? What kind of yield might a forest garden give us? You'd like to talk into that. Fruit. Fruit, absolutely. Plenty of fruit. What else? So in the chat, we've got root vegetables, fruits, edible leaves. Lovely. What else? Flowers. Fungi. Someone just said fungi. Absolutely. Fungi. Indeed. Herbs, dyes. Or garlic. Yep, lots of, again, leaves, whether it's garlics or other stuff, medicinal stuff, medicinal plants, brilliant. Honey. Honey, potentially, though not in my forest garden. <laughs> Coppice wood, mm -hmm. like willow or hazel. Maybe. Indeed, yes, good one. So um, um, we could extrapolate that to either building materials or crafting materials or, um, yeah, various, various other stuff good stuff yeah wonderful what else so so far most of the things that ah claude here we go now fresh air so up to claude intervened with a wonderful 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 suggestion most of them have been very human centric it's i.e the things that we can consume or use Forest gardens do so much more. Great, Charlotte is now adding shade, water retention. Um, you know the the ability to attract animals and insects and biodiversity. Then we've got yeah, thank you very much, James. Biodiversity. Um, so then there's all the, the the carbon sequestration. There's the you know locking in different greenhouse gases. There's you know in uh, in, well, when we talk about biodiversity, you know, as we know, um, one of the biggest challenges we face with modern living is uh, that we are, you know, we're, we're facing a potentially half a million species of animals, insects and things going extinct in our lifetimes because of our actions, because of human actions. Extinct means forever that's not replaceable. Climate change, you no know, climates can rise and fall and many people will suffer for sure, 100%. Um, and that's devastating, but eventually that can be, you know, that, that can somehow, may take 100, may take 1,000 years, but it can rebalance, but extinct is forever. Extinct will not recover. And uh, so for me, that's, that's really, really 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 important and so if we can grow our foods and you know you look at all the list of amazing things that people have said that we can get from a forest garden you know so from foods to building materials to um you know dye plants and glues and shampoos and you know say lots and lots of edibles plus as I say all the environmental things you know if we can uh create systems that do all of these things but in a way that also increases biodiversity i say that traps in uh carbon that sequesters carbon that uh traps in greenhouse gases preventing them from you know uh leaching into the the atmosphere you know um as someone said in the in the chat you know producing shade cooling the space creating lots and lots of biomass that is again lots of different animals and insects can start breaking down and utilizing you know um it this is a win 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 situation you know humans win nature wins animals win you know the planet wins it's just for me it's a no-brainer so um yeah so forest garden uh, for me first of all is a really intelligent way of us reconnecting with our surroundings recall reconnecting with nature meeting our needs but in a way that totally completely respects and enriches our environment and enriches the world around us so a community forest garden 
what does that add to the equation? So, you know, a forest garden adds, well, it's plenty enough on its own. You know, it does so many things for our environment and for us. But if we now add, make community forest gardens, what extra element does this really bring? Human to? beings. Yep. Human beings connecting with each other. So we've got education as people are starting to type in. And just before then, what have I missed? Micro and macro systems by comparison to monocrops. Oh, loads of people typing at the same time. Um, education, friendship, sharing resources, social connections, connecting people, well-being of locals. Absolutely. You know, if we look, so many people are really disconnected from each other, disconnected from their surroundings and lonely. And, uh, you know, so many different, um, yeah, mental and emotional challenges that we face, you know, especially, you know, now that a lot of the word is kind of getting out there, it's really clear to many people about, you know, the damage that we are doing to our planet. There's a lot of fear around that because let's face it, you know, the whole system that we live in has been designed to create fear in people. And with that fear, they can control. So we're, we're used to being in this kind of fearful state, which is why we are so imbalanced, which is why there is so much dis-ease, you know, ill at ease uh, in our societies. So it's a pattern that, you know, that we are continuously bombarded with. So let's just add one more thing to be fearful about, the environment, you know, the way, whether we will actually be able to survive on this planet or not. So this is something that, as I say, is, um, you know, is affecting a lot of people a lot, you know, especially with the a pandemic, which uh, has added a whole extra series of, um, you know, anxieties around it. Um, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot of fear, a lot of fear. And, um, and so one easy way to kind of start addressing that is to give people possibilities and opportunities to do something about climate change about biodiversity loss to meet some of their food needs to learn how to you know but more importantly to connect with other people to connect with others to to have conversations to skill each other because every single person that comes to a forest to a community forest gardens comes with history they comes with skills and knowledge. They may not all be great forest garden designers. They may not even have planted a tree or know which end of a seed to put in the ground, but they come with some knowledge of life. They come with love, they come with compassion. And if that's what they have to offer the community, that's amazing. You know, they don't necessarily have to know much about food growing, but if they can just bring an ear to listen, and you know compassion and what have you what a gift to bring to our communities so for me um it's a real no-brainer you know uh, um, forest gardens are for me one of the most immaculate most beautiful way for us to meet many of our needs uh, but then adding a community forest garden all of a sudden brings all the things that you've written in the in the chat you know all the the community coming together, education, skilling each other, hopefully inspiration, so that people will say, wow, yeah, I'd love to do that in my home. And then, you know, from your community forest garden, you can say, well, look, do you want a cutting of this? Yeah, just take that, stick it in your ground, it will come up. And, you know, helping each other to build those skills, to build that resilience, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, this is, this is why I'm really passionate about community forest gardens because um, they meet so many of our needs. Um, I think what I'd like to do is I'd really love for you guys to at least talk to each other a little bit, but there's quite a few people here, so it might be a little bit awkward to do it in um, individually. So I think what I'd like to do is just, yeah, create some breakout rooms. And let's see how many breakout rooms. Let's say, yeah, between three and four people per room. Let's just do that. And, oops, why has it done that? 
That's not what I meant. Let's cancel that. Recreate. Assign people automatically, yeah. Okay, that's done, that's better. So, um, and let's just say 10 minutes or something to just have a conversation about any anything that's coming up. Wh whatever, if there's something new in what I've said that is in interesting to you, if there's a question that you have, or if there's something you'd like to offer, all I would invite you to do is see if you can um, ensure that everyone in the groups, if they want to speak, has an opportunity to say something. So whatever you feel like inspired to say, whatever you feel um, is important to you to, to discuss or uh, ask a question about, feel free to ask it in this. And then we'll, we'll come back after that and see what questions there are and start answering some questions. So off you go. Enjoy having your chats. Okay, wonderful. Welcome back, everyone. So, um, yeah, so maybe does each group want to just, um, yeah, feedback? Um, let's have a look. Uh, yeah, so maybe group one, which is Ali, Bernard, Lynn, Sarah, Allen. Who's who would like to feedback from that group? Ali, go for it. Yeah, we were, we were just generally chatting, but Sarah, who's based in Devon, um, was asking about scale, what's the minimum space you need mm. to start creating a forest garden? So it's totally, the smallest one I've ever designed was about this big in, a, in my yeah. windowsill once. It was just, you know, it's a concept, it's an idea of how different plants uh, can kind of interact with each other. I mean, realistically, you know, a small back garden, um, is in fact if you look at how you know the, the history of forest gardening in the tropics which is where it's been done you know continuously for thousands of years you know in the case of uh i think in the americas they they can prove it's been going on for at least four or five thousand years in asia again similar kind of lengths of, of time uh typically it's each kind of family has you know like an acre or something and all of their food, everything kind of comes, you know, a lot of their medicines, a lot of their firewoods and various things come from that small space. And we see in places like Kerala, where, you know, where, where this is, has been ongoing for thousands of years, you know, it's, it's a relatively small piece of land. And uh, so when it was first, well, the modern history of forest gardens in the temperate climates, so and mostly it was to say developed in tropics, but the history of it in this temperate climate, i.e. places like England and Europe, it was uh, designed by a guy called um, Robert Hart, who was looking at how is it that we can grow a lot more trees? How is it that we can really encourage people to plant a huge amount of trees throughout England and he identified that obviously agricultural land is unlikely to go down that line because of economic factors they're they're they're, they're just so vested into you know ag conventional agriculture monoclo monocrops etc it's just not going to happen so then he looked what's the next largest available piece of land people's back gardens so what is it that we could do, he asked himself, to encourage people to grow more trees in their back gardens? And, you know, and obviously food growing, uh, you know, historically, you know, uh, many, everyone used to grow their own food, etc. But uh, then as this kind of modern culture emerged, where people started to, uh, you know, it, I can speak for sure for England, where uh once you got to a certain kind of level you distanced yourself from food growing because that's for poor people that's something peasants do i am i have my garden and i can put flowers in my garden that's how high i have raised myself uh, out of uh peasantry 
Um, and therefore, you know, I can afford not to get my hands dirty, but just to grow nice, pretty flowers in my garden instead. And this was so there, there's a psychological thing going on here. There's something, you know, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's something psychological going on in terms of growing food in your back gardens. But so this is what he was trying to understand. How is it, you know, if we actually look, the, probably the biggest reason why people don't grow foods in their back gardens is it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of failures for just a little bit of veg. And it's like, ah, oh, I can't be bothered. And because, especially because it takes continuous work. And many people in this modern day, modern kind of lifestyle, just don't have that time and energy. So what he looked at is if we could take this model that he saw in Asia, you know, in, in India, in Japan and various other places, if we could take that kind of forest garden kind of model, where most of the things that are growing are perennial, meaning that the system just takes care of itself. He said, wow, this, this, is, this is interesting. So he started to experiment. He experimented in back garden. And, you know, so many of the first designs were all kind of back garden scale designs. Uh, and then later on, as other people, you know, people like Patrick Whitefield and Martin Crawford and various other people started to get involved, you know, as the whole perm, you know, Robert Hart was very deeply connected with people who were first bringing in permaculture around the world and especially into England, you know, people like Patrick Whitefield. So they talked a lot, they designed a lot, worked together a lot. And, um, you know, Patrick Whitefield added a lot of clarity in terms of how to actually make it more self-sustaining. Um, and, you know, and then people like um, Martin Crawford have done a huge amount to really put really amazing designs together to show people really practically how it can be done. Um, so, yeah, so there's been a lot of involvement, but originally it kind of came just from a small space. So if I look at my parents' back garden, I designed for them, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, something like that. Um, it's before I even knew what a forest garden was. I've never even heard the term, but I designed something. You know, what I looked at is my, my parents, as they were getting older, they were, you know, they loved gardening. They loved being in the garden. They loved watching insects and birds and hedgehogs and squirrels. And, but they loved also eating from the garden and so on and so forth. But every time they would dig and they would do some work, they'd come back and they'd complain about all the aches and pains and what have you. So I thought, okay, let's be intelligent here. Let's see if we can design work out of the system while still giving them all the things that they wanted, which is this you know, abundance of nature, plenty of food, and so on and so forth. So I looked at all the different areas, from watering to weeding to planting things, making compost. How do I take that out of the system? And how does nature do that? And therefore, how can I get nature to do the work instead of them having to do it? So that's pretty much what I designed. And then it was later on, after a few years, I realized other people were doing this as well. And this was called forest gardening. And, um, and so while through their experiments, I know a few things that I would do differently now. But that's, this was my invention. This is how I came to, to make that. And so I've kind of now tweaked it almost to become like a forest garden. And I know in something like year two, I asked my mother to record all the different things she was eating. And I think she had something like 146 different edible yields from the garden. Because it's layered. Because, you know, as one thing dies out, something else comes through. And because, you know, because we're, we're creative, you know, many people probably don't even know half of the things that are edible in nature. And... Uh, so many people may be growing, you know, raspberries and not knowing that actually the leaves are also edible, for example, or strawberries or, you know, I've got a really lovely Szechuan pepper, for example, in my garden. And most people will know the pepper, but how many people will eat the, the leaf? You know, grape leaves are hugely edible. The, the leaves of um, 
mulberry trees are edible and so there's so many things that many people are not aware of that are edible so she started writing them down got 146 edible yields from the garden year two and then you know about something like seven years ago both my parents passed away and so more or less yeah um for you know probably about five six years leading up to the pandemic the garden was pretty much abandoned and when uh yeah when, when the pandemic happened I, I was kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere because the next place i was supposed to be going you know which was from france i was supposed to go to belgium then up to uh, denmark and then over to sweden all those borders were closed so i had to come back to england and i came back to the garden had to quarantine and uh, for the first two weeks, yeah, no problem. I just ate from my garden. And then when I was finally allowed out uh, after the quarantine, I looked at the shops and looked at all the queues. It's like, why on earth would I want to go to one of those? So I just carried on eating from the garden. It took three months before I, um, before the, this craving for peanuts got me. And I finally went to a shop to buy a packet of peanuts. And, um, and, I then started calculating what I was actually getting from my garden, where I was getting my food from. And something like 80% of my food came from just a relatively small, you know, London back garden. Um, so how small? Make it whatever size, whatever size you like. You know, uh, you can follow the principles. You know, if you don't have space for huge trees, have small trees. If you don't even have size for lots of uh, small trees, have one small tree and then lots of shrubs and so you know so you can scale it down the key thing is to think about the nutrient cycles to think about uh, the water cycles to think about how you can get a lot of yield by kind of stacking functions okay okay so another thing yes lenny was based in salford she said she's got like a thumb shaped site surrounding okay. the tarmac and it's got a massive stump in it and she's worried about being able to try plant trees because obviously there's going to be a massive root system underneath any tips so eventually that stump will decompose and actually feed the soil so i wouldn't be too worried about it um yeah i mean without seeing the site i couldn't give specific tips but um but yeah but i, I wouldn't be too worried i would still get get some trees and shrubs in there as well they're all you know um i guess it also depends on what kind of tree it was so typically if for example you take down an apple tree you should never ever ever replace it with another apple tree uh, so you should find something that's not in, of the same genus you, you should find something alternative so maybe a khaki person or something like that anyway interesting wonderful 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 okay let's see um group two i think uh anze and jay and suhasni yeah, oh. that group were there any questions coming up from that group anything did you pick pick a spokesperson so do you want to go oh no you go you go <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we had a very um, interesting conversation. So we all discussed uh, about our kind of involvement uh, in, you know, community projects and gardening. Mm -hmm. um, and Suhas uh, told us about the amazing project that you started uh, in East London. Mm -hmm. uh, so we spent, you know, a lot of time talking about that, you know, how it started. Um, and then uh, Jay told about his mapping, mapping project uh, uh, where they mapped uh, the... Um, kind of in York, um, maybe, maybe Jay uh, can explain better, but, you know, they mapped kind of, you know, community um, um, na natural spaces uh, in York. Mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting. I just, uh, I was uh, looking at the website. Um, and then um, I was explaining about, you know, my first uh, introduction to permaculture uh, when I was working on a green school project in uh, Nigeria, in Lagos, uh, with my friends. Uh, um, and, you know, how we are trying to translate some of the practices into, you know, urban education uh, about sustainability. 
Um, I don't okay. know if there was any, any question? questions. Yeah. Yes, I think there was a question about, you know, um, you know, how do you kind of nurture, continue? Um, Sue Haas uh, told us about this really incredible initiative that, you know, uh, what she's, uh, you know, trying to do, bringing, you know, um, old people in the community to the garden, you know, to kind of feel included. Um, Maybe one thing is, you know, what kind of support? So we understand there, uh, you know, you provided a lot of support for creating this space, you know, um, how important is what, what is needed in the community for things to happen? Like, what is the most important? Uh, the key thing, yeah, it's brilliant, lovely. The key question for me really is, uh, or the key, the key trick really is to, is not to try and reinvent the wheel. And if there's already groups, if there's already communities, if there's already projects and, you know, people coming together, try and find out what is it that your space could do that, uh, that would encourage them to come in and get involved. And so you're not creating a new community. You're just so, so we've got various schools coming in, perhaps, you know, Suhasni has mentioned that, you know, we've got uh, several different schools and, you know, and just the feedback from the headmaster about, you know, saying how, how absolutely crucial this project is and how he sees the change it makes in kids. You know, he says that many of them, even though they've got this really beautiful, lovely park, um, many, of, many of the kids don't even go to play in a park. They're so disconnected from nature. And... Um, and just to have them come running around and jump into the, you know, our, you know, wood chip piles. And, and then when someone says, who would like to plant something? Yeah, me, 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 me. And everyone wanting to, to get involved. He says, when they come back, he, he says, you can't imagine the change in these children. He says, it's, it's so valuable. So, yeah, so to think about, you know, what, what are those groups? And Suhasni does some really beautiful work bringing people together of different faiths um especially elderly people um and you know so she's already working with these amazing people and so how is it that you can utilize this space how is it that you make this space friendly for them and you know have activities that are safe for them and encouraging them to, to just utilize the space um Another thing that we've done, which is really beautiful, is uh, one of that we've made the pathways or a particular pathway wheelchair friendly. And, um, and the others are also kind of friendly, they're big enough, but there's one which is absolutely spot on in terms of regulations for, you know, so for someone in a wheelchair, plus someone walking beside them, etc, etc. And, um, and so one particular person, Ellie, um, who's wheelchair bound, you know, we kind of pretty much just named the path after her and had her you know we kind of officially opened it and you know someone took a recording of it and just the joy in her face as she was you know completing this path was just you know really brought a tear to your eye and so all these little things if really just seeing how can we involve all the different age groups all different um yeah, different peoples and, you know and, and say we, we it's impossible to actually create a new community around this. Uh, so really, it's about bringing existing communities to the space and then getting them to connect with each other. And in this way, you build up. In this way, we've had I don't know, 400 different people somehow engage in a project in one year. It's insane. It's, it's incredible. You know, in a region, I have to say, sorry, maybe I don't want to offend Sahasni here, but the region where we live, there is really no community. It's really, it's a really, it's a really difficult place. It's a really, really, really difficult place to, to get people to help each other and, and to really come together. It's... Um, Can you yeah. remind me where you are? I'm in Ilford, East London. Dagenham. Ilford. Yeah, Dagenham, Redbridge, Essex, that kind of way. Okay. So it's a, it's a really, really, really tough place to let's put it this way when my father passed away i moved back into this area uh to be around for my mother and i figured if i can set up a transition town in this area 
I can't think of a more difficult place to actually get some kind of community going than here. If I can make it work here, anyone can do it anywhere. And look, 10, 12 years later, it's buzzing. Yeah. It's, it's still happening and it's really bringing people together. So it's really, and it's credit to all the people who have been, you know, including Sue Hasni and many others who have really engaged with it and really, really worked hard to, to bring people together. Anyway. Rakesh, the point of getting uh, these elderly people, mm -hmm. they're all from different parts of Asia. Mm -hmm. They grew up in a forest kind of environment in mm -hmm. their own homes. So taking them to forest garden is almost like reliving their mm -hmm. early life. But without and the mangoes. <laughs> of course. No, uh, well, no mangoes, no banana trees, no, no, uh, no, <laughs> no chiku, no sapote. Uh. <laughs> at least they can hug the trees yeah exactly yeah exactly. so it, yeah. it is that memories being revoked gives them unbelievable happiness mm. Mm. lovely but the other thing for I would, doing all that really yeah uh, the other thing i really would love to know anze said uh, about rainforest i've never heard of that before so i wish at some point we would be able to hear about that project as well the rainforest is just a, a bioregion. So, for example, Assam and many parts of that part of India are rainforests. Oh, right. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just a bioregion where I can't remember the technical definition, but it rains, I think it rains maybe four days out of the week or something on average. I can't remember the exact definition, but it's uh, really, it's raining more often than it does in, in London. Mm, <laughs> right. So actually, you'd be surprised, you know, many people think England and London, it rains all the time. But actually, I think the average here is something like um, 590 to 610 millimetres, whereas, you know, many parts of Europe are more like 1,200 and something like that. So actually, we get a lot less rain than many parts of Europe. But there's this image. Yeah, of, of it raining all the time in, in England. Anyway, yeah, let's hear from group three, which is uh, Claude, Dee, and Steph. Who's feeding back? Steph, perhaps. Hi. Ah, aha, that's not Dee. Yeah, right there. Um, so, um, Claude and Steph, all right, I didn't even catch the name, Steph. Sorry about that, Steph. Um, but we were, we were talking um, quite a bit about, um, you know, um, what was around me now at the minute, and I was talking about the hugel and some of the medicinal plants, things like that. Um, Steph had a few questions because she's, you know, part way through developing a forest garden. And um, so that was... Um, that was nice um and claude um he said that his understanding of the concept of forest gardens quite it's quite different from where he is in the world mm -hmm. saying um com as compared to like you know what you may maybe what you're describing Rakesh, with like a how 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 this are um designed in in mm -hmm. this part of the world so, but we didn't get a chance to finish that conversation, actually. We, we, we came to okay. an end. So what, what part of the world are you in, Claude? Uh, I am in Cameroon, Central Africa. Aha, uh -huh. so tropical stroke subtropical. So yeah, very different. Wow. You are so lucky. Wow, because the, in the tropics, um, for anyone who hasn't been to the tropics, it's, it's a little bit strange because uh, there's almost no soil because the bacteria works so fast because of the humidity and the type of bacteria that whatever falls to the ground gets broken down and gets turned into biomass so quickly. And, uh, and so you have these bigger fruits, you have, you know, uh, so they're all competing. And you know, if anything, many plants are like, oh, how do I get away from this sun? Rather than, oh, how can I find my way to the sun? So yes, you're absolutely right. In the tropics, it's in subtropics, it's a really totally different environment. But uh, wow. And then, as you say, the fruits, the different, uh, if you've never been to the tropics and had like fresh 
fruit straight from the <laughs> tree. The things that we get here that are just like, you know, really sour and like, why would anyone want to eat a star fruit, you know, in this country? When you go out into the tropics <laughs> and you have love apples, you have wood apples, you have uh, dragon fruits, you have um, oh, so many snakeskin fruits and ah, you're so lucky, my friend. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing in this country, to tell you the truth. <laughs> really the yeah the tropics and it goes all year round there's something growing all year round so yes you're absolutely right it's a very 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 different environment compared to to here anyway um I'm, i know i said that we'd go on till eight o'clock but we're not going to get through all the questions does anyone mind I, I don't mind staying on for an extra half an hour is there anyone who's got a question that's kind of burning that they'd like to, me to cover almost immediately and then whoever can stay on we can talk for another let's say 20 minutes half an hour or something is there from either the other groups like a really burning question that anyone has you've answered one of them already which was the way to generate community mm. but the other one we had was um how do you protect your forests from overuse so once you've got you've established your forest garden um, so the context for this was a, commun a forestry com community forest in Nepal. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, how to get forest gardening in there, but then also encourage stewardship. So when you say overuse, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. So knocking out other uh, organisms in there uh -huh. in the interest of the humans so if you're using it for food and fuel and you know and shelter and 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 mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um as the population in that area of nepal goes up right um i think it was uh matthias uh was saying getting the balance right is quite hard so nepal is kind of uh an interesting place because it's it's uh, it's closer to being uh, temperate than it is tropical. Uh, but then you've got the monsoons. So you've got, um, you, you, you've kind of got, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more unusual bioregion in terms of what can grow. But, uh, but and obviously, in, well, it depends where you are, but the, the temperatures can drop really significantly, you know, to minus whatever. And so you can't necessarily have food growing all year round there. But again, it depends depends where you are. Um, so in in a way, we can I can almost I can more closely design things that are temperate climate in a place like Nepal. And um, and so the the types of things you can grow you can still get a huge amount of um biomass a huge amount of diversity of plants and you know and we're, we're um you know stacking functions so we're stacking you know plants so there's a lot of things growing everywhere which means that you can get a lot of food from a very small space so uh, if we can design our houses, and this is a really a, a huge challenge in a place like that, you know, because they're, they're very much copying the, the craziness that's happening in places like India and the rest of the world where everything is just concrete, 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 concrete. And, um, you know, rather than looking at their, their ancient building structures, uh, which were much more in keeping with the surroundings, but because, yeah, population is growing significantly uh they're, they're just going down what they consider to be easy options so i'm just going to mute um Daz. sorry uh, that's right yeah by the way for people i just met uh, darren Daz in uh in leeds um a few weeks ago what an amazing character the work that this guy is doing seriously he is he's a community champion uh, he really is an amazing character how he's bringing people together so actually he could be sharing this this talk because he's got an amazing way of um 
of really working with a really wide range of different peoples from from his environment so yeah keep in touch with this guy he's he's really something special a real a real gem of a human being um so yeah so so in in somewhere like nepal um yeah unfortunately yeah with the expansion of you know um of people um it's gonna encroach on nature uh but if we can instead of you know building big cities uh which completely destroy nature if instead we can be you know having small little communities little hamlets so to speak where we build simple uh structures and then just have forest all around us feeding us you know i do an exercise where i get people to imagine projects imagine you know um whatever project it is whether it's an eco village they're starting or whatever and i get them to try and imagine it's 20 years from now and all everything they wanted to do in this project is done they're living there they they they've achieved everything that's in their hearts everything that's in their dream to to do is is done and then i get them to walk through it and you know i get them to wake up in their their house whatever that might look like and do whatever they need to do but then when they open their back or their front door what do they see and it doesn't matter where you do this in the world whether it's india whether it's you know germany whether it's uh, denmark whether it's um england everyone has this same dream they walk out and they see blue skies they see trees and on those trees is fruit and everywhere they see is just greenery they hear birds you know they they can pick things straight and just eat it fresh you know there's no cars and noise you know uh you know that kind of noise pollution going on you know there's children playing you know there's someone who's doing some work and they you know when they say hey rakesh can you give me a hand you say yeah of course i can of course i've got time for you and and everyone has this dream it doesn't matter where it is in the world so i think it's it's a primordial you know it's a really ancient dream that we all share somehow and if you think about it what they're dreaming of is a forest garden they're just dreaming of a forest garden whether it's a tropical forest garden whether it's a temperate forest garden is a you know different story but they're dreaming of this same thing so really it's a case of um rather than pushing this paradigm of trying to live you know this this kind of fake kind of american dream that the that the west is trying to push on the world to say this is what you should aspire to because let's face it no one almost nobody except the rich are actually happy and maybe even the rich are probably not happy they're so worried that someone might steal all their riches so even the rich and that's why you know so no one's happy in this system nobody what dream rubbish nonsense um so rather than selling this dream let's sell a more beautiful dream and for me that that's that's the the, the real solution it's um is to sell a dream that is realistic which is a dream of us reconnecting with nature reconnecting and connecting with each other and really just loving each other and and what have you so for me that that's the way i would start to to really look at what's happening in in places like nepal um anyway let's room 4 i think is matt sara and vanita who's um who wants to feedback who's got some questions from that group matt you or yeah hello um yeah we sort of chatted we didn't get anything very strong i'm in middle of norfolk uh sarah and and uh, vanita were both currently in london and sarah has been in the us and is looking to move to i think it was somerset yep uh, uh, we were sort of all up kind of asking the question sort of how sort of how to do it how to uh, get these sort of community things going um okay i think, I think one of the biggest questions was um 
how yeah how to start connecting with people um mm. i think benita had has a really uh interesting uh issue do you want to talk about that benita that she actually has a community garden but doesn't know how to yeah, yeah. Uh, we've, we've spoken involved. before and, uh, and there's a lot of tension around your area isn't there yeah, I can't. I can't talk because I'm on. I'm on one percent. I'm sorry, and I'm trying to charge my phone. It's not working, but I'm listening until I disappear. Okay. <laughs> no problem. No problem. But yeah, I, I know some of her challenges. We we met before in, um, on the uh, conference, and um, and yeah, and this is again. It's about a lot of social conditioning and how people. The paradigm of the world that we live in. We're continuously, you know, right from a child told that we must compete 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 we must be better than the other children you must get top marks must get top marks we must be the best and um and this kind of mentality that that brings uh of continuously wanting to be better than other people is what really encourages us you know one way that we can be better than other people is to continuously put other people down you know to make myself look better by making oh you know that sarah she's a da, 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 da. you know that matt he's a da, 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 da. and this nonsense of rather than encouraging saying my wow sarah look at the skill she has amazing and look at matt wow he did this and he's fantastic at that rather than encouraging each other and supporting each other the the, the modern paradigm is to actually push each other down and uh so she's living in an area where she's got a lot of tension people are just fulfilling this uh this pattern that the world is telling us that how we should live so yes yeah, so it's how to how to change that how to bring about and the best way to do that is around um is by giving people good positive experiences so what does it take to create those positive experiences and to a certain extent you know so when someone uh, disrespects me or something that I could then for the rest of my life just say I hate that person because they instead you know because what what value does that bring to my life to just l have labeled someone you know um, in whatever way um, instead I'll, I'll try and understand well why why did that person behave that way what what's what was really behind that it, you know it's not easy I'm not a saint uh, I don't get it right every time and sometimes I do end up really you know ah. Uh, but, um, but as much as I can, I'll try and understand why they're behaving that way so that I can then meet them at their level and then see, can we between us somehow change that paradigm? Is it because you're hurting somewhere? Is, it, is there something that you, is this a cry for help, for example? And is there something I can support you with? So, so we can start turning things around. And um, yeah, and obviously, uh, the, the decision making patterns that we have, especially, you know, yeah, the decision making patterns we have is is really awful. It's, you know, whoever shouts the loudest, whoever has the most money, whoever has what, for whatever reason, the most power is the one who gets their way and everyone else tough. Who cares about you? And that just makes so many people miserable. So instead, uh, the, the tools that I use are sociocracy and uh, you know dynamic governance which uh, when it works well when people really understand it and work with it it means that everyone is um has an equal you know uh, opportunity to express themselves in a project no one person has more power than anyone else so you have instead of a hierarchy of people you have a hierarchy of processes of ways in which information moves between your your system between the peoples and therefore everyone knows anyone can join any particular area any particular region and uh and they know what the the, the, the remit is in each area what they can make a decision about what they can't make a decision about and at the end of the day if you're making a decision that affects somebody else that person who it affects must be involved in the decision making process. They can't be ignored. You cannot make a decision that affects someone else without them uh, at least being invited to participate. They can choose not to, 
but they must be inv invited. So, so in this way, we can really, you know, create really dynamic, you know, the other name for sociopathy is dynamic governance, which for me personally makes much more sense because sociopathy is just, it's just a big confusing word that is for many people even very difficult to say. Uh, dynamic governance, yeah, I can get that. Governance, yeah. Okay, I can understand what governance means. Dynamic, ah, oh, flexible and changeable, and yeah, that so that kind of works. And um, yeah, so for me, uh, establishing things like dynamic governance is in our projects is really enriching, and and that's that's a solution for how we can start bringing people together to really work work well with each other. Group five: Charlotte, Mark, and Matthias who may have had one of his questions answered already, but if, we, if there's something else from that group. We jumped in a bit early because I wasn't okay. sure if we were going to run away. That's fine, no problem. So, okay, in that case, should we move on to group six, which is James, Melody and Sarah Orm. Is there anyone from that group who would like to? Yeah, I think that was us. Uh, we ended up with just um, just just me and me and the other lady, Melody. Uh -huh. um, who, we had a nice chat about what's going on in in Portsmouth and Telford, and our interest in in uh, forest gardening and, and permaculture, and why mm -hmm. we were here today. Um, but the question which I put in the chat was. Such a late, I was getting later, so I've forgotten what I asked. But <laughs> okay. How no do problem. we, I think it was, how do we get people, um, oh, how to motivate people and keep them motivated? Mm. Which I think you sort of, sort of, sort of cover, covered but slightly, but that was the question that came from me and Melody. So keep asking them what they need. Keep asking uh, what. Um, so, so my favourite term is, you know, what what's making your heart sing. You know, is there anything in this project that's not making your heart sing? What could we do to make your heart sing? And just by continuously asking these people genuinely, because you really want everyone's hearts to be singing, and genuinely ask that question and really hear what people say and then see, all right, how can we do that for you? What is it we could do collectively to really help you really become alive and really, really start loving being with us? Because we, we want to love you. We want to show you that love and respect and, um, and really allow you to really thrive while you're you know, in your life. So by asking those questions and hearing each other, um, and then, as say, making efforts to 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 really try and deliver that, that's what keeps people. You know, at the end of the day, any of us can grow food, any of us can make a forest garden, but having a connection, deep connections with each other, having a place where you can go to that you know is safe, where you can just express yourself, where no one's going to judge you where people will try to understand you. Um, this is magic. This is, you know, um, this is something that really, you know, people don't forget that. And people, Rakesh, people really love and respect that. Rakesh, yeah. can I come in here? Please, Please do. Um, two projects which has worked. One is uh, we hired a, a, a small uh, hall and we put lots of leaflets in, in the surrounding houses saying that there'll be a food fest mm -hmm. where people demonstrated how to cook. So how to cook, you know, spe speciality of their country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so because it was a demonstration and it because it was from multiple background people, it worked a treat mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they had a, a goal and the goal was to showcase their speciality. Mm. And we had a tasting session after that. And people, you know, their connection was incredible. I love the it. second one is um, growing uh, the front gardens. 
-hmm. What some of us act have actually done, we have grown tomatoes, chilies, uh, cabbage, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, from seeds. And we have given seedlings to our neighbors, five or 10 neighbors immediately, you know, to my, to, to my right and left and front. Mm -hmm. And I have created a WhatsApp group for only these people. And we interact only the day before yesterday. It was such a happy time. You know, I had some chip, uh, chip, what is it, chip? Wood, wood chip. chip. I had some wood chip. So they were all intrigued as to why I had so much. <laughs> and, you know, they all came. It was really, really beautiful. So in the course of the time, I told them about the forest garden. Uh, and some women came along as well. And that's where, you know, I've got the names, connections. Mm -hmm. And this is practical, irrespective of what they are in their walk of life. It doesn't matter. It works. Absolutely. No, I totally agree. The, the one thing that can bring most people together is food. Everyone has to yeah, eat. Exactly. And so, yeah, having some kind of festival about around food is really is is beautiful. It's really magical. And um, yeah, no, I know. I totally, totally, totally know. And I've done many projects like that in um, uh, in a particular troubled area where I used to live in South London once. We started organizing, you know, all the groups would were literally separate, you know, different communities all keeping within themselves. So I organized uh, various things again around food where, you know, this community would all come together, you know, that community would come together and we'd, we'd organize all these different uh, events. And then uh, with the, the, um, with the intention that later on, all of them have to meet and then share, as you say, the best of all the food that you had when you were together in your little community, share that with everybody else. And, and then, you know, and so we, we invited um, yeah, different peoples and all of a sudden you start seeing people connect with each other that have never connected before because now they can share a common language, a language of food around, you know, so all the people who know how to either grow food or cook food, uh, could all of a sudden start to speak to other people who know how to grow food or cook food. And um, and they could share recipes. They could share, oh, from my region, we do it like this. And, da, 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 da. And, and it was really, really, really beautiful to see. And it's, you know, one of the first times I've seen so many people from different parts of the world, from different cultures in this particular area of, of South London, really coming together. So, yeah, it's... Um, I totally get that, and it's lovely, and yeah, and the front garden, and to answer uh, Vanita's question, Sue Huss lives around the corner from me <laughs> in Ilford. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to write, but I'm not able to do it. No problem. Yeah. And so, yeah, so we're part of the same transition group, the same forest gardening group, and uh, and this front gardens project is something that I was also involved with, and, you know, and I have connected with people who live in, in my street who I've never spoken to before. Okay, I haven't really lived here for almost 20 years. Well, actually more than that, 30 years. Um, but more recently, you know, I've, I've moved back in because of the pandemic for the last couple of years. And I moved, I was here for a year and a half while my mother was still alive after my father passed away. And then after she passed away, I carried on traveling again. So I don't really know many people here, but through this Front Gardens project, was really lovely i could you know i knocked on lots of people's uh, doors and um yeah and it was wonderful yeah so now I, I can speak to several people on my street in fact as soon as i returned back from leeds uh as soon as i came in one of my neighbors hey rakesh do you want some tomatoes i've, I've already grown some here you go Good. you know and um yeah it's lovely it's really really nice to have that connection in this area Thank you, Lynn. So, wonderful. Um, okay, so let's let's maximum let's say another ten minutes. Are there any other questions coming up? Anything that has not been answered from? Yeah, from what? Um, yeah, anything left un, unasked? Rakesh, my apologies to people 
who have asked me questions. I'm not able to type. I do not know why. Apologies. No problem. No problem at all. So I put in uh, into the chat a, a link to my campsite, which basically has a link to all of my links, so to speak. Oh, Rakesh? Yes. Uh -huh. We we do have a. There's a question in the room here. Perfect. Yes, um, please. Because there um, there was a question about pests. Uh -huh. How do you deal with pests in a forest garden, like caterpillars, slugs, these type of things? You love them. <laughs> there's, there's, there's loads of slugs in my garden but there's more food than i can eat so they're welcome to them uh i have so many butterflies and caterpillars and they because i'm not growing you know uh things like uh carrots and well i do have some potatoes admittedly uh but I'm not growing so many tomatoes. Okay, my neighbors give them to me occasionally. Um, I'm not growing lettuce. I'm not growing many of the things that most people grow. Most of my stuff is perennial, uh, perennial or self seeding. And that's the point of a forest garden is it just maintains itself. So because there's so much of an abundance, there's so many varieties of different flowers opening at different times of the year uh that they all attract different subsets of of insects uh they attract lots of different um yeah different predators so they all somehow manage themselves but it is heaving it's really you know when you go out there the the number of different types of bees in the garden is is insane if you if you look on google maps and you look in this area you'll see most there's not much greenery in many of the gardens you know they're, they're kind of lots and lots of lawns and things like that but not so many trees there's a few but my garden is then just crazy and poof, this is where all the life is there's so much life in this garden it's 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 so beautiful and um and yeah and so i say my my cabbages are full you know i can always if I wanted to, I can pick off 10 slugs or snails from my cabbages every single day if I wanted to. But they live there. They eat what they want. There's plenty left for me to eat. So, um, you know, if I look at the cherry tree, for example, you know, the birds probably eat maybe, maybe 60, 70 percent of the cherries. But do I care? I still get a hundred carrier bags full of cherries. Do I care? Absolutely not. Am I, are they welcome to it? Absolutely they are. You know, why should I deprive them of their ability to thrive on this planet? You know, the, the, it's, it's nature. Uh, we need to share. It's, it's this attitude of, um, of you know, of, of where, where we start doing monocultures where we create a, such an imbalance and we don't want anyone, any insect from actually eating any of our stuff. And, you know, because we're so greedy that we want everything for ourselves. Uh, this for me is, is actually the problem, not the pests. It's our attitude that is more of a problem. Whereas by allowing um, lots of different animals and insects into our space, sharing our space sharing the food you know our space even that is a bit of a weird weird concept who 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 actually gave it to us you know who took it away from animals and insects it's it's our land it's our space and um and so by encouraging them in you know as the more the more life there is in the garden the more food there will be in the garden but of a particular type so it's more a case of relearning how to uh, how to eat things that are actually, you know, actually also if we look at how many of the vegetables are grown, um, because they're grown in soils that are so devoid of life, bacterial life and, and what have you, insect life and so on, that there's, there's, it may look like a big carrot, but actually it's completely devoid of energy. It's completely devoid of life and uh, of, of dynamic energy 
So when we eat that, it's lacking minerals, it's lacking this dynamic energy. So when we eat it, it's more or less we're just eating fiber and some minerals. And it's not really fulfilling us. Whereas something from a garden like this, just a small amount of, um, you know, a small amount of food, uh, which is packed full of minerals and packed full of uh, life, energetic life, can fulfill us. You know, and so there's more than enough for all the other animals and insects, but whatever little we get is, is full of energy. So it means we don't need to be destroying so much of our environment for food growing, because actually, if we learned how to, to eat dynamic foods, yeah, we, we, we wouldn't be in this situation. And so there's more, more, more than enough for yeah, all the other caterpillars and the, the, you know, the slugs and, and everything else. So, so for me, I, it's, it's absolutely not a problem. It's, um, it's only if you've got something close to a monoculture that you're going to have problems with pests because you've, you've created the environment that they can, you know, that the predator of that particular animal is lacking, you know? So if you scare off all the birds uh, and then you're surprised that there's so many caterpillars, or slugs, well, you've scared off all the birds. You've taken away the predators that would have created a balance, you know? If you haven't created a habitat for frogs and for uh, hedgehogs and all these kind of things and for birds, you know, it's no surprise you've got, um, yeah. And, and if, again, if you're growing certain foods that those animals, are, those insects are really gonna love without attracting the predator for it, yeah. Um, again, it's it's about humans' concept of wanting to control nature, of being the master of nature, wanting to control her for our needs, uh, but without respecting and taking care of all the other animals and insects' needs. And this is why there's an imbalance. That's why you get pests and things. So it's more of an attitude. Anyway, it's getting late. It's about half past. Um, so if people are really interested in forest gardening, I've got a lot of uh, videos on my YouTube channel. If you look at that link, in that link is a link to my um, I say YouTube channel. Uh, we do a lot of videos from Roots and Resilience Network, uh, which shares all kinds of things you know, for free from um, how to ferment foods and um, yeah, um, how to grow different types of foods, what's growing in a particular time of year in a different region, what are you harvesting, what are some of the craziest things you're eating right now. There's a whole bunch of different videos, making biochar. Uh, then if people are interested in permaculture and like reggae, I've got a whole series of podcasts which basically describes permaculture through reggae. So maybe that might be interesting to some of you. Um, there's also a list of all the workshops that I've got. I've got lots of forest garden courses that I'm delivering all over the UK and online. I've got a whole series of courses that I do uh, towards the end of the year, which step-by-step -step walks groups, especially community groups, to get them to actually design their real, real projects. So if any of that's interesting, you can email me or you could um, yeah, just follow that link and, and find all the details there. So... If you've got any questions, feel free to email me. Um, maybe we'll close the, I'll stop the call now. But if anyone has any private questions, I, I'm happy to stay on for an extra five, 10 minutes if there's anything really burning for anyone. So thank you all very much. Thanks for coming. It's really lovely to share my passion with you. And um, yeah, hope to see you somewhere somewhere soon and hope to be see you in Denmark soon when is it July I think June July somewhere like that <laughs> so awesome lots of love everyone take care thank you, thank you. have fun I say if anyone's got any questions I'm happy to stay on for a, a little bit longer